All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our special edition of our Wednesday Lunch and Learns on, on Monday. Because today we are talking about what I think to be one of the absolutely biggest uh, co contributions to the cloud space in a very long time. We're talking one leg. So today we're here with Josh Elizabeth. Josh, welcome. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. How are you guys doing today? Great, Chris. Thanks for having us. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And hey, if you're new in the channel or if you've just joined us, let us know where you're from so that we can kind of keep track of everyone who's tuning in and listening. Josh, Elizabeth, you both work at Microsoft, but where do you actually live? Where are you guys from? I'm in uh, Bellevue right now. Um, okay. From Philadelphia originally, though. Okay. Um, but I've uh, been here the last almost 15 years now at Microsoft. Oh, my. Okay. Elizabeth? I'm also in Bellevue. Been here for about 10 years. Before here, I lived in Austin, Texas. And then before there, a couple other places. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, Kevin tunes in. He's from uh, uh, Austin as well. So uh, hopefully we'll see him um, too. But um, uh, this is a lunch and learn where we are trying to uh, educate people on uh, what it is uh, when we talk about One Lake. Um, we do have a, a, some rules because we are going. We do want to get questions in from people. Um, we are going to be following the the Matthew Roach uh, uh, rules. I've got those copied here someplace uh, from Guy in the Cube. So we all kind of have the same community standards. Um, uh, one, uh, preface any question with the Q colon uh, so that we can make sure that we see those pop out. And then number two, uh, if you spam the channel, uh, we will block that and and uh, and and stop that from happening. So um, uh, just be aware uh, that we do have those two rules; uh, they are out there. Um, but if you do have questions, post those into the chat, and we will be, do our best to help you. Um, but before we head into any of that, uh, we are. Uh, watching or uh, and you may have noticed that this is the second link i am uh this is my fault i'm using a new streaming service uh, i really like it uh but uh power bi or power bi guy recommended it um it's new to me so i apologize i'm gonna click on something i've not clicked on before to see what happens oh that was exciting uh <laughs> transition <laughs> yes yes there we go <laughs> um uh because i i really wanted to 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 hone in and and listen and talk about how elizabeth and josh how did you guys get into technology and start working on this project what was your journey yeah. elizabeth you want to go first sure um yes i've been at microsoft for about 10 years i'll start from recent and go backwards um okay it's my whole time here, I've been in big data storage teams. So when I first started, I started on uh, Cosmos, which is the name of the system Microsoft uses for big data and learned so much from um, watching our own Microsoft teams um, deal with exabytes of data, processing it, needing to support all different technical abilities of users and making it as simple as possible. So that was, um, a great team to uh, get knowledge on big data. And then I evolved into the Azure Data Lake storage team. So I worked as a PM on Azure Data Lake storage gen one and gen two. And then it's a great evolution into one lake as you know, just making it simpler and more accessible to everyone. Um, all the great like insights you get from big data. But before that, I actually came from um, kind of physics and academia. I got my PhD in physics. And oh. I was a, an experimental nuclear physics um, subject area, and we had to analyze big data. So I was more like on the other side, consuming these you know, big, massive, super competing clusters, trying to analyze tens of terabytes of data, which was really big back then. And then, um, you know, having to yeah, you know, learn as you go, you know, your main job to be done is the physics part, but you have to learn how to analyze that data, write scripts and programs to get, to get whatever um, insights you want done there. And so I picked up a lot of skills and tools along the way, and that helped 
me transition to be on the, the product side when I joined Microsoft to actually help build these systems for others to use. Well, that is fantastic. And I, I uh, it, it's kind of funny that you say that because something I've been talking about for about a decade with, with people in data, the data space is if you're in tech, you think in code and code's super lightweight in comparison to data. And I've always said, data has a mass and there's physics involved in bringing data together. And so I think it's funny that <laughs> you have a physics background that, that seems like it fits with everything I know to, to be about data. Oh, that's awesome. And Josh, what, uh, what, what's your background? How did you get here? I journeyed around Microsoft a little bit. Um, not through the academic route though. Um, <laughs> I came in and I was, uh, I actually, so actually in 2007, I interned on what was Project Gemini, which became Power Pivot uh, initially. I wrote wow. the uh, SharePoint integration as a developer, uh, which um, not everyone's favorite feature, <laughs> um, but uh, shouldn't have had an intern there. But uh, after coming back from being an intern, I, uh, I started on MS Sales, which is actually the internal reporting platform for the company. So I spent about three years there doing all the all the sales reporting. Back then, if you went to like a Comp USA or uh Best Buy and bought a copy of Windows. It all got recorded, and you know we we pulled together all the sales data for the entire company. Wow! And uh, uh, honestly, it's your MS Sales or the Starlight architecture. I, I, I'm a super big fan of. So well, they show some of that now. Some of the the newer MS Sales stuff is actually in some of the Fabric demos, which is kind of cool. Um, then I kind of journeyed on though to some bigger data. We I went over to the Bing team, uh, Bing ads specifically, and did uh, BI on top of their massive data. We would get like three petabytes coming in uh, wow. every you know, every single day there. Um, that wow. we turned into something useful. And this was kind of back in the days before Spark existed. And you know, we were using Cosmos, with Elis which Elizabeth was working all the time. Um, and yeah, we did BI on that. And I spent uh, several years doing that. And after a while, I wanted to also start working on the product side. And uh, taking some of what I learned and, and turn that into stuff we would actually get out to customers. And I joined the analysis services team probably about six months before James Phillips showed up and kind of changed okay. our world and said, hey, you know, at the time I was doing uh, I was doing SSDT and I was doing um, uh, Power Pivot for, for Office and work on the next version there. I was working on the... Um, the actually the IntelliSense and the, the measure editing and... Um, Basically, we said, all right, well, you know, we're now we're going to start this new thing called Power BI or re redo this new thing called Power BI. Um, and uh, six months later, all the stuff I was doing in office and, I'll, and a heck of a lot more shipped as part of Power BI before we ever shipped it in office. And, uh, and we launched Power BI you know, 2.0. And uh, I did all the, the developer experiences, all the content packs, which originally came out uh, with, with uh, Power BI. Um, and then I went on to drive Power BI Embedded, mm. uh, then Azure Analysis Services, uh, then Power BI Premium. And uh, then I went over to the Synapse team and um, got there probably about a year before we actually started doing Fabric. So I went through that same journey again now with two teams uh, going from this uh, uh, PaaS world or in the, in, the, in the Analysis Services case was more of an on-prem world uh, into this kind of SaaSified world. So it's been a fun journey multiple times. And One Lake was uh, kind of a byproduct of that. Well, that is that that's fantastic. Um, uh, cause I, I actually, I had a conversation with a, a coworker. They said, Oh, Microsoft fabric, you name you mean Synapse 3.0. Hmm. And I said, no, I think it's more like Power BI 3.0. Cause we're, we're really bringing more of that self-service enable a team. Uh, what's your take? And is there internal hmm. scuttlebutt on how you think of it? Well, I love it when we when we first did Power BI. It was an interesting reaction um, from from <laughs> customers, from partners. It was almost like you can't do this. Um, you know, this is not the way enterprises work. This is not the way data software works. This, you know, um, you know, we were going up against Tableau at the time, um, and Power BI like 1.0 had been out for a while and was not getting a ton of traction. Um, and we were you know, working on our different products or our different office products. And, you know, there's power pivot and there was, there was power view and there was power query. And, um, and then there was SQL server, which is where analysis services was going. Um, so we had all these different products and you would stitch them together and we're like, all right, we're going to do a new SAS product. Uh, there hadn't really been a SAS product for data. Um, and it was just all that feedback. Like this is not how data works and this is not how people buy data products and 
you know, now, and then we went through and did Power BI and Power BI was Power BI. Um, and doing the same for, for Synapse this time uh, with Fabric, a lot of the same feedback. Uh, and we would say, well, work for Power BI. And there'd be feedback saying, well, not the same thing. And it wasn't the same thing back then. Uh, so I think Power BI really changed the way you work with software, you work with data. Um, and I think Fabric's going to do the exact same thing. Yeah, and and, and I agree. And I, I I love Fabric and I, I love having been part of the journey for a while now. Um, so I'm very appreciative of that. And I, I will say that um, I thought it was all great until you, you kind of came up and said, hey, we're talking about this new thing called one lake and you start to lay it out to me and i thought oh my gosh this is potentially bigger than everything in fabric like fabric is awesome but like all of the tools that currently sit on top of fabric tools come and go but like the foundational pieces live forever right like okay hey we're about to get into it but i, I think this is i think this might be the biggest component that was shipped with fabric Oh, well, it was interesting because you think data lakes, you know, what's what's so special? What's what's why mm -hmm. are they so important? And you know, when we have conversations with customers, oh. or when I was doing it, especially on Synapse too, data lakes were just constantly, constantly coming up. And it's like, all right, well, it's just where you put your data. Why is it always coming up? And yeah, you know, we would talk with customers. There was just these super high expectation. Every customer I talked to would tell me they have one data lake. <laughs> and it's very pristine looking data lake, right? It's like, all right, it's our one really nice data lake uh, where we can drop all the data from organization and it's just like super easy to land it there. And once you land it there, then it's just super easy to do anything with it. You can discover it. It's all in one place. Uh, it's, so it's really easy to, to secure, really easy to discover, really easy to govern, really easy to blend it all together, really easy to transform it. But yeah, the analogy I like to give is, yeah, if you remember back, to file sharing prior to Dropbox and OneDrive. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very different game back then. You would buy storage, you would buy these network file shares and you would go rack them in, into server rooms and you would go you know, set up these, these folders and you would share those folders and you would share files through folders essentially, right? Yep. Like you would build these sharing solutions and it, it worked. No one loved it, um, but it worked. <laughs> um, and yeah, but you were able to kind of collaborate over files and then Dropbox comes along and OneDrive comes along and it really just changes the game. They give you a SaaS service for actually sharing files. Um, and if you look at the way we do it now, we would never go back. And Dropbox, ironically, was one of the original uh, metaphors we used when we were actually designing Power BI because, there were, like I said, there's no SaaS service for, for BI at that time. So we looked at other SaaS services and Dropbox had this model of easy sharing of, of, of easy... Uh, bringing data together, or sorry, bringing files together, and and easy uh, getting it out and collaborating with other users. So a lot of the initial Power BI uh, model of, of even being freemium to sign up initially and then share with other users. A lot of that was even based on Dropbox at the time. Um, but those metaphors kind of really carried over to data lakes. Because with data lakes today, you don't buy a data lake; you buy storage. And then you got to do something with that storage. Um, you got to go turn it into you really got to turn it into a data lake and it's up to you to really implement that data lake pattern yourself. And uh, what I would see is like customers would come in and tell me, Hey, we only have one data lake. And I know I talked to the, to other people one. in the company. One. Yes. Well, except for this other one, but you know, and then I talked to the other people in the company and they'd say, Oh, we have our data lake and we have our own data lake too. And I'd go back to those other people and say, Hey, you said you had one, but these other teams are building their own. They're like, Oh yeah, they shouldn't be doing that. Those aren't the real data lakes. <laughs> Um, but you mean true. just like the other data warehouses and the other data warehouses that don't exist. And it's yeah. true. You end up with multiple things, mm -hmm. lots of things. And instead of one data lake, you have multiple really siloed data lakes and they don't really know how to talk to each other. Um, that whole pristine vision of being able to connect it together is not really there. So what you end up doing is you build solutions to make it happen. And usually those solutions are involving like data movement, copying from one place to another, uh, bringing it together. Even once you start to consolidate, once you start to break those silos down, you're not done, right? Like most applications, most users don't talk to uh, data lakes directly. So you build data marts, cubes, uh, Power BI data sets, data warehouses, things to serve the data. And these aren't just you know, referencing the data in the lake. These are copies of the data. 
and these are copies of the copies of the data. It's never happened with you, Chris, right? I uh, not not once. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I've never experienced anything like that. Um, Except for that uh, time, the other time, the other time. Yeah, 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 every hour of every day for the last twenty years. No, I, that is. <laughs> yeah, I knew. I mean, I remember you and I talking even before, um, even before Fabric came around, and these were some of the challenges you were dealing with. And this is a lot of work to, to not only build this but maintain it and and deal with it. Um, and uh, it's ongoing work; it never ends. Well, and, and Power BI guy is saying like. Sounds like you should be maybe making it a data ocean. <laughs> data ocean, sure. Another another water thing. Um, <laughs> it's a vast amount of stuff. Let me put it that way. And it's always find it funny as the well, let's just say interesting. You know, you start out with trying to have one thing, and you end up with lots of things. One thing has some drawbacks, has some problems. It's really hard to collaborate over one thing. It takes a lot of people energy to actually uh, to really work together and collaborate over one thing. And a lot of times it's just easier to have multiple things. Yep. So you end up having multiple things in cases where you want to have one because it works around certain problems, but now you're dealing with lots of things. And the solutions to dealing with lots of things is typically to add more and more things, right? Yep. Add data catalogs, add just more lakes. Um, and they may mitigate certain problems here and there and they treat some of the symptoms, but then you have the added cost of adding and managing these things. Um, so a data mesh pattern kind of came in, right? And said, all right, well, you're all, everyone's having trouble collaborating over one lake. So let's kind of change the pattern here and let's everyone work independently on their own lakes. Um, again, more stuff. And that's, I think a fine pattern for the products that you had today or you had in the past, let's say now. Um, yeah, it, 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 it works. It does solve those problems. Um, and it's really all you can do with the products that you had at, had at hand. But you know, thinking about it from a product's perspective, when we're designing new products, when we're designing a new SaaS service, it was kind of just very straightforward to say, all right, well, people want to work on one lake together. They want to collaborate together, but it's too challenging today. So how do we attack that problem head on? How do we make it less challenging? How do we make it more possible to collaborate on a single lake? Well, and and that's what I, how what, one lake was born. Yeah, and what I really, really love about that is it brings, it's, you know, when you talk about this, that distributed picture that you had, everyone just sees their slice of it, and they don't know how big they are or how little they are inside of that that world, right? And and uh, often, I, I think what we're about to see, and I talked about this on Friday, but I'm going to talk about this for five years, I think is that IT thinks that they are the world and they own all of the data. And uh, I have a feeling we're going, as we get into one lake and, and people start to really dig into this, IT's going to see, oh, we own this segment of data, but it's not all of the data. And it's far smaller of a percentage than we had anticipated. So and a lot of times I think excited. they know what's going on there too, right? Mm -hmm. They know there's stuff happening. Um, and right, they're just blind to it, right? They just can't see it, you know? Well, there's not, and there's not much they can do about it, but um, it comes up that, hey, we need to do something from uh, because that's why I think so many companies are looking for these uh, governance tools. Yep. Ways to scan their entire data state, look at your entire data state. They're trying to look at their entire data state because they can't see it, they can't find it, but they know it's there. They just don't know what's happening. Right. So if you can get everyone, think OneDrive today, I think mean, you know where your files are. As an admin, you yeah. know where your files are, right? It's you don't have to go hunting and finding, uh, looking for them. They're there. They're somewhere, um, and that's the easiest place to put your files. So most likely, they are going to be there, um, and you can govern that. You can control that, um, and you can see what's going on. So I love the OneDrive mm -hmm. for data metaphor. Yep. You know, I've seen some eye rolling every every so often when we say it the first time, but it goes away very quickly because you start to look and think. Wow, yeah, you know, what am I doing for files today? How is this relevant for data? Having all that, having first having a service that you don't have to build yourself. Right. Key. You have the data, but you have a data lake now as a, as a service, not as a white paper that you can implement on top of storage. That's huge in its own. Yep. But going back to the metaphor of OneDrive, it's there. It's, it's the easiest place to land your data just because it already is there. Everything can just land in it automatically. If it's coming from Fabric, it'll automatically land in there. Hopefully over time, more things will just automatically land their data in there. Anyone can land their data in there today. Mm -hmm. um, and 
un, you know, unlike other other, uh, you know, unlike not having one lake, you know it's there and you know it's governed. Everything is ultimately under control of a, of a tenant admin. They can set the policies, they can set the controls on it. Um, and any data that lands there is just going to be automatically governed by those policies. Um, but just again, like OneDrive, you can have different teams working very independently. That, that admin does not become a central gatekeeper. You know, OneDrive, you have your own personal spaces, you have your own uh, team sites, uh, you have your own team's channels, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no admin had to go in and approve that and give you access to it. In, in Fabric and One Lake, you have workspaces. They let you work very independently. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm excited about this because I start to think about all the integration opportunities that we get by having our data in one singular space with common tooling, with common integration, with common security. Mm -hmm. Now we can start to do things like having true data quality that gets defined one time and broadly applied everywhere. Like, oh, this is going to make life so much better for people. And you can see it too, which is great. Right. Like it's all in one place. Let me skip ahead a little here. Like, <laughs> yeah, you have that single management gut boundary. Yeah, that's another thing that was like very different between PaaS and SaaS. Like SaaS, you have a tenant. Tenant's your organization. You know where mm -hmm. it begins. You know where it ends. It's just a natural boundary that you get mm -hmm. now. So you know your whole company. So we can give you one lake for your entire company. And any data can just land in it. You got those workspaces for that distributed ownership. Um, if you, and if you're familiar with, uh, and this is actually a lot of times when IT will say, all right, well, let me turn this off for certain users because we don't want all our data landing in one location. Right? We don't want all our, we don't want uncertified data. We want data that's just randomly coming from under someone's desk to land right next to our pristine kind of IT approved certified data. When you do that though, if you shut off the lake for certain users, mm -hmm. it doesn't stop them. It just stops them from putting it in one lake. They'll put it somewhere else. Uh, and you don't know if that data is being governed. You don't know if that data, you don't know any, how that data is being used. Let them put it in one lake. Let them put it in one location. You know what's governed by default at that point. And they can mm -hmm. use data endorsements, which has been a feature of Power BI for a while, now carries over to one lake. And you can endorse certain data. And you can say, this data is approved. Uh, this data is recommended. And then your good stuff starts to rise to the top. And the unapproved stuff should sink to the bottom, keeping to our water references or metaphors here. <laughs> um, if it doesn't sink to the bottom, it still manages to float. You can see that you can start to figure out why, and you can decide what to do about that. Usually it's something valuable that IT is not doing yet. So what do you do? You recommend it, you get it certified, you get it fixed up. So the point you can go ahead and use it, you take it over by IT or it's complete junk. And you know, you then take some action, uh, as regards to that, but you can see what's going on here. Well, I, and that's, that is spot on, you know, if all of your salespeople, happen to be using an Excel file that is out of date by 60 days, but that's what they're using to drive whatever business or recommendations. Like now we have visibility to that and we can, we can figure out a way to help there. Right. Like, Oh yeah. I spent my first eight years at Microsoft in night in you know, different IT teams here with MS sales. And then uh, Bing was a little bit of both IT and Bing product. But um, you know, whenever we didn't provide data, people found a way. Right. Yeah. They, they, they did. They got. They find a way to get their job done, um, and uh, that could mean getting data from multiple sources, making different reports, um, and those are valuable. Uh, but you still want to be governed. You still want to make sure that they are they are reliable sources of data, um, and you know one like really helps you see and, and and make make all that possible. Really, sure. And as Donald is po posting in the chat, that he loves the ability to do linking. Mm -hmm and have that same data exist wherever it goes so yeah i'm excited about that too yeah i mean the other the other mantra of one lake has been one copy and that's just you know, really getting the, the most value out of a single copy of data so shortcuts is one of the features of one copy which lets mm -hmm. you kind of reference data in different locations and virtually assemble it together with these kind of symbolic links that so you can think of shortcuts on your desktop sure point to one location and the data will look like it's physically there um, without duplicating, without copying it. Another way too that you can ensure that um, even if different different parts of the organization are reusing data um, and potentially reusing it in uncertified ways, but they're still referencing the original data, that data will stay up to date. That data will will be will be still powered and controlled by the original certified owner of that data. That's so awesome.
Now, I, I think there's going to be confusion that comes along with it, right? Like, okay, so I have a link. If I do an aggregation and persist that aggregation, it's not going to automatically aggregate for me, right? No, it's not. So uh, if you actually do copy the data, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a different... It's a different copy of the data. And sometimes you know, there are lots of reasons to copy data. Right. right? There's a lot less now, though, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's a big deal, right? Like yeah. You're copying data for really technical reasons before or to break down those silos like we talked about. You were just copying data. To get data into a more capable engine, sometimes you're just copying data. It's very hard to secure data in a data lake, right? So there's not a lot of security capabilities today that compared to what you would get in Power BI or you get in SQL. So what do you do? You copy it out of the lake, you put it in those other locations and you use those more capable security features. So you're moving stuff around just to get features or just to combine data together. Um, you don't need to do that anymore. Right. Yeah, our modern data warehouse architecture saw you copying it into bronze, silver, gold, and then it's getting gold and it's ready to go. It's ready to serve. Then you copy it again into the data warehouse and serve it. Right? <laughs> and your data scientists, maybe are using it somewhere else. Like all those reasons just to copy data don't have to exist anymore. Right. And if you think about like the processing time that you save, the computes time that you save, the do the storage costs you save, that's that's huge, right? That's uh, extremely huge. Like um yeah, spending all that time on analysis services. Yeah, and talking to customers about how, why, and how, why it was important to copy or sorry, process their data. As a time consuming that uh, effort, it took a lot of code, it took a lot of monitoring, and um, and it put a lot of latency between when you when you saw the latest data available for your reports, and all that's gone. With and this. and right. you might have lost users along the way too. Said, oh, this is too difficult. I'm I'm not going to look into this data set and now. You can have different skill sets, different familiarities mm -hmm. with Spark or SQL, and they can start accessing that data, um, depending and use whatever tool they're most comfortable with, which I think is such a great value from from one copy. Well, and Elizabeth, you, you kind of like hit right on it. Like that's an even another reason why we might not need additional copies, right? Now you can use the data that's right there as a link and it speeds up the process so no longer is chris a bottleneck to you right like i'm not mm -hmm. i'm not behind you could just use the data and you just have access to it so i'm moving faster so you know yeah, you know, that could be a huge win for teams right yeah and blending the data is super important with different across different teams in your organization so making that easier making the, the querying easier i, I could see like just new possibilities coming up that weren't attempted earlier as well sure yeah. sure oh just so exciting um uh no we've been uh we've been going into the overview of this um uh josh do you have any more overview we want to go to or because i know elizabeth has some stuff to like go in and show us some some sure I mean, we got we can go there. in any which direction here there's tons of overview there's uh tons of details to drive into uh, and there's there's demos for sure as well too so whichever direction you want to go okay you. well i tell you what we have a question from donald Parrish. he asks um uh he has an adls g2 sales data partition uh with folders for years month dates and he can create a shortcut to sales in files selection of data lake house for sales folder structure mm -hmm. but so far he's only able to open a single parquet file into a table and instead he wants to bring over the entire folder any ideas or tips is that something you can do so back up for once uh, what was the first part of the question um it's got him in folders for years month dates i have years month dates and i created a shortcut to this to sales in the file section um why did you create so, and these are parquet if these are parquet files so if these are parquet files and they're partitioned by sale by year month day and they're under a folder called sales and if it's, sorry if it's delta lake directory i should say if you just create this directly into the table section it will become a table automatically whether mm -hmm. it's partitioned or not um if uh if you're uh, let me see the second part one more time sure I'm going to convert a single parquet file to a table. 
Um, I'm not sure how you're trying to convert at the moment. Um, so yeah, if it is a, let me put it this way. If it is a, uh, just a Delta directory, uh, you can just put that in the table's location. It'll just work as a Delta table. It'll be discovered and you just use it automatically. No, nothing to convert at that point. If it's just parquet files or CSV files, um, you can shortcut those into the file section. You can shortcut the entire ADLS account too into the file section if you want. Um, and it'll just show up in there like it is ADLS. And then you can use a pipeline. You can use a notebook. You can use whatever you would normally use with ADLS too, just to reference it from that location. You can write it into the table section. Uh, and that won't matter if it's a single file or multiple files. It'll just work like it's a, a ADLS connection almost. All right, so down a couple options there for you. Hopefully that can uh, uh, that can work for you. All right, awesome. All right, let's head on over to Elizabeth. I know you've been itching uh, to to get into some of the details that yeah. you've got going. Uh, we're gonna bring you up and 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 hone awesome. in on on your screen right now. Thank you. Yeah. You so. Bet. I'm going to talk a little um, about One Lake File Explorer. I think it's a really great way to demonstrate some of the concepts that Josh has talked about, One Lake. Um, and also, it's great for all different personas of so people who want to try out One Lake and Fabric and different use cases. So, essentially, in a nutshell, you can download One Lake File Explorer. Um, you can find it at aka.ms/slash One Lake Explorer that sends you to our documentation page. But you download this, and then once you install it, you now, in Windows File Explorer, see all of your One Lake data, um, just alongside your other <laughs> you know, data on, on File Explorer, like you know OneDrive and everything like that. Um, so this could be used for people who want to quickly like do some tests or, or demos on sample data they have stored locally, which I can demonstrate next on how to get your sample data in. Um, or you might want to make some quick manual edits to a file. You can open it up and view it in your notepad or any you know, sort of text editing apps and, and, and um, edit files locally. Uh, and some people have been using like Parquet editors that they have um, installed on their machine. So lots of different options here. You can create folders, files, all those sorts of things. So, But just yeah. as a reminder or for clarification so that we're on the same point here, these are just parquet files, right? They're Delta parquet files, open source files. If we want to go in and make an edit with any of these tools, that's okay. So one lake is has all these different kinds of items. And in the lake house, for example, you have that files folder and a tables folder. And so in files, that's a place where we want you to store any type of format of data that you need to store. So it's on, you know, it's like an ADLS account where we support all different file formats. So you could be, mm. um, you could have a, a config file, a JSON file that you wanted to update something quickly. You can have CSV files. If a header was miswritten, you know, you could update that header. So um, there's no uh, requirement on what type of format that you can put into to one link. But if it's in Delta Parquet, then that's what the engines can use to display it as a table, do those querying, those kind of patterns on top. So, so really, I, I really better like take structured and unstructured files as well too. Well, that's fantastic. So I can have a whole bunch of videos or images yeah. and I could just have them in my one lake. Yeah, let me demonstrate it actually for you. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> Let's see it. So <laughs> here, um, yeah, at the header, you'll see one lake, and then you have all the workspaces that you have access to, just the ones that you have permission. You know, we check that you have the permission to view all these workspaces. And so I'm going to look at one of my workspaces. And then under here, you'll see the names of your one lake data items under here. So I have a couple lake houses and a warehouse. I'm going to... And why, why are you doing that real quick? Those yeah. icons that you see next to it um, in the status. Yeah. It doesn't just download your entire one lake to your local machine. Um, everything you're seeing here is basically a placeholder. So it's like a, it's like almost like a little phantom representation of the actual one lake. And until you actually try to download or open something, it doesn't actually make it available in your local machine. So it's not like egressing everything from your entire lake locally. It's just making it look like it did. And you can work like it, like it did. But yeah. it's really on demand pulling stuff over as you need it or uploading stuff as you place it. And so That's as and on the whole egress thing, right? So 
if I'm using tools that are in the service, like I'm using uh, Microsoft Fabric, I'm not, it, there's no egress there because it's just the service using the, that same data, right? Yeah, everything that you're doing within the service stays within the service. Uh, we follow the same rules for um, as ADLS uh, for, for accessing data. When you start to access it over the public internet outside of the storage, then they do have like an internet access uh, a fee that gets charged through ADLS um, that you'll start to see. They give you like 100, uh, I think it's like 100 terabytes or something or some, something like that included to, be, to start with. And okay. then they start to give you some, then they start to charge you on top of that. So these things, I mean, you're downloading to your local machine uh, when you actually go ahead and access them uh, in the case of the file explorer. And those would go across the public. Everything else, when you do it in the service, everything's always in the service. So that's great. So I have a hundred terabytes of back and forth with no uh, big deal or something along those lines. hundred something, yeah. Because <laughs> MIM is going to ask, right? Um, <laughs> Let me go look it up now. The exact yeah. number. <laughs> right. yeah, but if you just don't download it, right? If you just stay in the service, there's no, nothing's moving around, so you're still good to go, then, right? And these, I mean, these are your local. These are files coming to your local machine too, so they should be rather tiny, right? Yeah. Like, how much can I hold on my local machine? I can't hold all of this, right? And there's other um, similar tools like Azure Storage Explorer. Some of you might have been using today to work with your ADLS or storage accounts. Um, it's kind of, you know, similar. Okay, awesome. And hey, uh, great news. Uh, 100 gigabytes, sorry. Oh, 100 gigabytes. 100 okay, gigabytes. That, yeah, first 100 gigs. That is significantly lower. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but Jessica was just able to download and install this. So you've okay. got one new <laughs> install, at least from this uh, from this live stream. So good awesome. job. That's great. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So let's look at a lake house next. So when you open a lake house, you see those tables and folders that are defined within your lake house. And so there are these top level folders, which are always created with your lake house. You have a files folder, tables folder. And I'm going to use the files folder for the demo. So um, right now, I actually am showing the same lake house on the web portal. So let me do a side by side um, view here. So you can see I have a shortcut folder and a config text file here and here. So let me take a picture that I have on my local computer and put it into that lake house. So I have what? I have the sample image JPEG. So let me control C, go back to my lake house, and then paste it in. Okay, and then I'm gonna go back here, refresh the lake house, and then I'll see that sample image and, and there's a picture. So oh my. Uh, so you can, as soon as you put a new file in File Explorer, it's automatically triggering it to be synced back to one lake service. So it's a very quick process and you can also create new folders. So what I'm going to do is imagine I want to run a quick sample um, uh, job on a, a data. So I, I'm going to create this folder called NYC Taxi Data. And then if I go back here, I see that folder is already created. So back to my sample data, I, I have some Parquet files that I am going to use. And I'm going to copy that and then put it back in my lake house in that new folder. So Donald, she's doing what you're talking about here. So now um, let me refresh again and then i open up my folder and you see that file in there so now i put some sample data in my lake house and i want to query it with my fabric notebook so let's let's expand this again um i have some sample commands to run uh to read the parquet do some filtering and i'm going to write it out as a delta table so assuming i created my folder with the right name this should succeed my favorite is when you just land the Delta. If you have Delta files actually on your machine, you just land them right in the table section and you just start querying them directly. 
Oh, my I don't know how many gosh. people actually have Delta files stored in their local machine, but if you do, it's kind of fun. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, Jessica does have a question. She says, in the files area of the lake house, that's just a place to store files, right? Essentially, Maybe. it's up for however yeah, you want to use that. You can create folders, put files of any format in there. It's just not being monitored for the tables to automatically show you that metadata of the tables. That part is only being done in the tables directory. If you're following that medallion architecture, a lot of times you'll have um, yeah, your bronze and your silver layers may not be in Delta Lake. Okay. In the native format that the data is coming from, files is a great place to land it. Files is a great place to land also unstructured data. ML, AI will work on top mm -hmm. of unstructured data. Yeah, you know, you're dropping your videos in there. You know, you could drop a whole bunch of your recordings in there and have something that tri gets triggered to go put captions on there automatically if you want to. Right? All the kinds of things you can do in a data lake, you can do here in a lake house. You didn't have to go provision anything else though for the storage, which is the big difference. That's awesome. And now that that fits into Jessica's next question, which is, is this going to supersede SharePoint? Um, well, you think of like OneDrive and SharePoint for documents. Think of this one lake for data. Yeah. Right. Yes, you can put documents in in uh, in one lake. It's not going to give you the, all the great document collaboration that OneDrive gives you for sure. You can put data in SharePoint. It's not going to give you the throughput and the performance that you would get uh, on big data over EDLS or one lake. So they are they're mutually exclusive in terms of of the the scenarios you're using for and the benefits. Um, but a lot of similarities and how and just the ease of use and how you can work with them. Uh, a great you bring up a great point right like it's so instead of just people dumping csv files out into sharepoint and then you having to load it into some data place that takes forever and it's, it's poorly performing you could just put these into uh one lake and have a better experience there yes yeah we've talked about maybe doing shortcuts over mm -hmm. OneDrive and sharepoint so if you do have csvs or things in there you could just go use them but you wouldn't use that. You wouldn't put like a petabyte of CSVs in SharePoint and try to use them from from one lake if we ever did that, right? It's right. It's not designed for that level of throughput and performance. But you put it in one lake, it, it definitely will be. Awesome, 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 awesome. All right, I'm going to show you one more thing, and then we can probably switch to learn more about the one lake areas. Um, in the okay. Overview. So I created that Delta table in the tables directory. So that means I yeah I wrote it out through the Fabric Notebook. I want to sync mm -hmm. those changes back to Windows File Explorer. So what I do is I right click and I say sync from one lake. And then um, I guess I could have opened up the tables to show you that it was empty before I clicked sync from one lake. But now <laughs> we'll have that folder trip table. Um, as you can see, it was created yeah, at 1110. Um, and you see that parquet file in that delta log table or delta log folder there. Mm. So underneath you know, all of these artifacts are creating that Delta Parquet data. And now you can navigate it and see it in your One Lake File Explorer view as well. Mm. That's just fabulous. Uh, now, a, a question. If we look at, uh, I think that says status, we see the One Lake, it's in the cloud icon, or I'm sorry, we see the OneDrive. Are we uh -huh. gonna see a One Lake icon there eventually to differentiate so you we can- it. Oh, you mean the stat? The status is the uh, status of the file, which yeah, means, yeah, that's just that means saying it's in the, in the cloud. Right, right, right. It. Yeah. Okay. But if I go yeah. to that, um, like that sample image, I I had it local, so now it's showing green. It's saying that okay. it's stored yeah. locally. Yeah. It means it has an egress. Once you actually go and try to use it, it would download uh, and it would turn green, and then okay. you can have, you can tell it to kind of free up space on your machine when you don't want it to keep so much local. But if you're using the same files over and over again, it's not going to keep re-downloading. It'll have them cached right here if they haven't changed. I gotcha. This is yeah. fabulous! Wow. So, yeah, wow. I encourage Are there other to ways to get? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I, again, I just want to encourage people to, to try it out and let us know uh, how you've been able to use it. And uh, where do people go to enter feedback and provide uh, thoughts on that? Is it just Twitter and blast out people saying, you know? <laughs> There's that. It doesn't get quite as orderly uh, recorded. But if you go to aka.ms slash fabric ideas, uh, it's a great place to give uh, suggestions and vote up other ideas. Um, and that also will keep your stuff recorded and other people can support you on the ideas as well, too. Ah, fabulous. 
All right, I'm trying to pull that up. Hmm. Um, but all right, so uh, you said we should pivot back over to Josh. Josh, you look like you've got a little demo here too for us. Well, one thing to kind of point out here is you know, the file explorer is a nice, you know, simple way to just kind of like upload some files, see what you have, explore. It's a great way to see the entire lake, but there are lots of ways to land data in one lake uh, or get data from one lake. And Elizabeth talked about too, uh, uh, Azure Storage Explorer works as well. And the reason it works is because we supported the full ADLS Gen 2 SDKs and APIs. Mm. So we did a lot of work to make one lake look like the entire, to look like actually ADLS. Now under the covers, it's lots of storage accounts. It's lots of things. It might be, you know, it might be a bunch of shortcuts to lots of different places. It could be shortcuts to S3, but we did a lot of work to make it look like it was ADLS storage account. Just mainly so that existing applications um, uh, can can continue to work on top of one lake. So mm. I have Databricks here. Or I have Databricks. Let's see, I don't have it open at the moment. Let me open it. I have a notebook in here that does a bunch of transformations and lands the data. Um, you know, lands data, originally it would land it in ADLS storage account. Um, while we're waiting, let me get that session started. Um, so, um, and while you're doing that, uh, let me quick ask a question from yep. Nate. Uh, Nate has a question. He says, is access to one lake controlled view the workspace model like we do for Power BI? If we are familiar with that, does the same mental model apply? Yeah, so the same access to one lake is controlled right now through the workspace or through, uh, they'll have sharing at some point soon, uh, which will be more artifact level control. So if you give mm -hmm. someone access to the workspace, if they're an admin member or contributor, they can see all the files uh, in one lake and they can access uh, everything through the workspace as well. Um, when we, sharing is coming out soon. So when you give someone a viewer role, they don't actually have access to the files in one lake, but there's a permission coming that will give you, that you can just grant people access to the files without having to give them access to the entire workspace. Um, so it is controlled the same way you would control mm -hmm. access to the data really to any of the other, like to a data set, basically. It'd be controlled pretty much the same way. Now we announced one security. We didn't share a ton of details on it yet, but that will give you more finer grain control over the data itself. So down to the column and row. Uh, event, you know, we have a couple phases there, but eventually down to the column row, which will give you the, the cell essentially. Uh, and that will give you much finer grain control. Now we got to give you enough control. We got to give you enough features in the lake itself. So you don't have to copy the data somewhere else to use it. So you, know, you don't have to copy the data into another data set to secure it. That means we have to have the right set of features there in the lake itself. So that's kind of where we're going with the security. Well, that's fabulous. Sorry, you were, you were, you were, you were pulling up Databricks. Yep. Yeah. So for me to actually go write this, let's say I was going to write this to a new storage account. I'd have to go to Azure. I'd have to go create the storage account. I'd left that provision. Here, I'm just going to go create a new lake house, which is right there. We'll call it the uh, And uh, you know, this takes a couple seconds. Seconds. I always try to time it so it finishes right at the, the end of the sentence. And it's there. <laughs> now, to wow. write data in here, there's nothing in it, just empty tables and files. If I right click on here and I say properties, I can see the path oh, to that. So, if you're, using, yeah, if you're using most tools, this is you, you can find the path right here. If you're using something like Spark, it uses the ABFS driver, ABFS driver. Mm. Um, and uh, for convenience, we actually have that whole ABFS path right here, too. So I can just copy that and I'll take that and I'll paste that into the output of my notebooks. I'll just change this one URL. Oops, I'll keep the uh, quotes though. Um, open tables. Let's run this and while it's running, we'll take a look at it. Um, so what the path is here, it's, you have one lake for your entire organization. So that is just one lake.dfs.fabric.microsoft.com. Ignore this MSIT part, that's from our early rings here. So that's your storage account, basically. It's just one lake.dfs.fabric.com.microsoft.com. And okay. this is basically my workspace. Workspace goes where the container would normally go. 
And this is my, this is the lake house we just created. So the name of the lake house, dot lake house, the type. And then I'm just writing these tables. These are Delta tables to the table section and the table name. So if, are we running yet? Yeah, we're starting to run. Daybreak's just warming up. The session just got going. So we're starting to, starting to run these. And when they run, they'll start, you'll start to see them just pop up and they'll work uh, they'll start <laughs> right away. Here we go. So all I really had to do to point this to uh, one lake was change that ABFS path to now output to one lake instead of the storage account it was pointing to before. And it, Databricks just thinks it's ADLS, doesn't know any different there, and it'll just start writing to it. And I can wow. do the same for reading from it as well, too. So can see Hold on. Things. So yeah. you're saying all of the assets that I've created over the last five years in Databricks, those thousands of notebooks and run books, all I have to do is a director, directory switch in there? Yeah, you have two options there. One is if you want to start putting them in one lake, uh -huh. change the path, it'll land there. If you're keeping them in ADLS and you're happy with them in ADLS, you can just shortcut them right in and they'll appear uh, physically. They'll appear as if they're physically in your account at that point, physically within your one lake at that point, which I just okay. created a shortcut. Um, now, also, the other way is true. So if you have data in one lake, I created it in a warehouse, I created it in a lake house, mm -hmm. you can leverage that in Databricks as well. And you can then write it, you can do some transformations of it and even write it back to the lake house if you want to. Oh, my That's gosh. Great. Hold on. So if I wanted to use that endpoint, that SQL DW endpoint that exists inside of Fabric, and I have, I have Parquet files already... All I have to do is create a link into a lake house file structure. It's going to automatically appear in there as tables because they're Delta Lake files. And they'll already appear inside my SQL DW that I have it, that I've, my SQL endpoint in here. I can actually save you a step. Um, if you go into the, if you go, I don't have the warehouse open. But if you go into the warehouse and just right click on the table, you'll see that ABFS path there. You can just take it right from the warehouse. Holy crap on a have cracker. Make that makes it so much easier. Yeah. Everything, it's an open data lake. So everything is natively going to be stored in one lake. If it's a table, it's going to be natively stored in one lake in Delta in Delta Lake format. And then anything that knows how to work with Delta Lake, like Databricks for sure does, you can reference the path to it. If you have access to it, you'll be able to see it and use it in those, in, in those applications. And that includes the data we just wrote in here. So here's data that wasn't here before. Now it's just here. And I can go start building a Power BI report directly against this. I can start running SQL queries. I can start running notebooks against this. So even if I flip back over to the SQL endpoint, so every lake cast is also going to come with a SQL endpoint mm -hmm. uh, where you can run two SQL queries against. And um, tables here too. And I can just start writing queries against this as well. Can I say how nice that is? Because I had an effort to convert SQL queries over to uh, uh, Spark SQL. And with this out, we just stop that. We're okay. We now just use this. So that's a huge yeah, I, um, time saver. I had to dust off my ANSI SQL knowledge when I was trying to put some demo <laughs> together. Um, Chat GPT helps a lot though now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think we have some co pilots that are going to make that a lot easier yeah. soon, right? Definitely. But see, T SQL is great. I mean, you get the full power of T SQL here directly over uh, data in, in Delta Lake. Um, and I didn't, I literally, you just watched me do it live there. I didn't do anything special. I didn't even pre-cook this one, uh, other than having the Spark notebook already ready to go on the Delta Lake side. I was on the Databricks side. We just, we created the, we created the lake house for the first time. We just updated that one string, hit run, and now I'm running SQL queries. But I, I think, I think still that's such a huge, huge play because now we could just use it with very low effort from uh, any of our engineering teams, right? So instead of just going to one storage account that isn't integrated into one lake, we could just put it into one lake. Are there roadmap plans to bring all of our ADLS storage accounts into one lake by default or automatically? Well, it, there's different ownership. There's, there's different mm -hmm. teams that own those accounts. Um, and yeah, you know, there's a lot of times good reasons to keep stuff separate. You don't necessarily always want it discovered, right? Um, so what I hear from a lot of customers say is they'll 
they're looking anything they already have they're looking to keep and they'll probably shortcut those in mm-hmm. going forward as they start new projects they're thinking about okay well can i just land it in one lake uh at least saves you the 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 maintenance of another you know, another resource you have to go ahead and maintain sure um, our, we don't have a strong preference here having an adls have it in one lake um you'll be able to shortcut it in either way uh one lake uh, you know, we'll be there ready to go Whenever you want to bring data to it, nothing else to provision, nothing else to manage. Mm. Wow. Wow. Um, now, there is a question in the chat uh, from Greg. He wants to know, can we connect to an Amazon S3 or GCP? Uh, is that possible? Hmm. How does that work? Amazon S3 is there right now. Uh, okay. If I go back to the lake house, I'll show it to you. Um, GCP is coming. Um, we're trying to get Amazon <laughs> fully finished. Right okay. now with Amazon S3, what you'll see is the ability just to create a shortcut to it. Okay. And you, know, you pop in your connection details for the Amazon S3. It'll just pop up in here like another table or another folder, depending on which section you put it in. And um, you, you'll use it like it's ADLS, basically. So it won't look any different than ADLS at that point, um, even though it's coming from S3. Um, so that's there now. That works. The part we're adding um, is some caching around that. So the the uh, main goal of the caching, the performance is actually pretty good without the caching, but the main goal of the caching is actually cut down the egress from S3. Uh-huh. Every time you pull something out of a cloud, there's egress. Right. Um, and you'll probably be doing this. This is not going to your local machine unless you open it in the file explorer. But um, <laughs> typically, if you're writing a notebook, you might be going over some very large volumes of data. So the, the, there will be, uh, there could be some sizable egress there, and the caching will actually help reduce that. Um, you know, pull data once, uh, and if you're reusing the same data without it changing, it'll then serve it from cache without you having to go egress it again, which will make a big a big difference there. So that's coming, uh, and then we'll start getting to work on S3, uh, uh, sorry, GCP after that. Oh, that's awesome. And then uh, Nate has a question here about, say, can I have a shortcut, or say, I have a shortcut in operations workspace to a table that's in the sales workspace. Do mm-hmm. sales members need access to the operations workspace to view it, or is there a different way? How does that work? Uh, good question. I mean, uh, I'm kind of curious how you'd like it to work, but I, I, and then I'll tell you what it does. But um, uh, so what it actually will do right now is uh, when you're going across workspaces, uh, there's two pieces of this right now. So in the current in the current preview, what it'll do is um, you do need access from the other workspace uh, to the original data. However, right now, the data sets and the if you're going through Spark, essentially, it's going through SSO mode. So if I if I create a Spark notebook against that data, uh, I would need access to it. So I would need access, mm-hmm. in this case, to the operations workspace. And that way, the owner of the operation workspace is the one controlling the access to the data. The SQL endpoint and the... Um, and the data sets are kind of running what we call a delegated mode right now, where they actually run as a as the owner of the um, of the data set uh, and the, sorry the owner of the of the lake house in this case in the sales workspace. So that person needs access to the operations workspace to see the data, um, but they're allowed to delegate access to other users when they share the data. Um, and that makes it a little e- bit easier to share. So not every single end user, every single business user has to have access. And it's very typical today that you won't necessarily give end users access to all the data in the lake. They'll give some BI Pro the access, they'll build a data set, uh, they'll build mm-hmm. reports, and then they'll share that out and give people access to those data sets and reports. So that you can still do today, and that's how it works. Uh, when we bring in universal security or one security, um, you'll be able to do SSO in, in all these modes in SQL and Spark and in data sets. And uh, you'll be able to decide, do you want to delegate the access or do you want to actually pass through the credential all the way through and control the data access all the way down the lake itself? So, sorry, long answer. Um, more developments but, coming there. But but that's right. I, I think you, that's a great question and a fabulous answer because there's what's today, what we're going to have in tomorrow. So. Uh, Nate, if you want to work a different way, hit up that fabric.tips and, um, or ideas at fabric. Yeah, uh, ideas. Um, aka.ms slash fabric ideas. Yes. Um, I got to get that down. aka.ms dot fabric dot ideas. I got, I got to say that. One word. Okay. <laughs> All right. But um, we are at the end of our hour. Josh, Elizabeth, 
thank you so much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. You know, you guys have done an incredible job with one leg. This is something that not enough people are paying attention to. Your work is going to just transform tech for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So thank you guys so much for all your hard work here. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us here. Yeah. Yes, yes. And and thank you guys who, for joining in and tuning in and listening to this. We really appreciate it. You know, we're here to, to like inform and learn together. So if you do have questions, leave them down in the chat. Like, you know, if you're watching this on replay, please let us know. Happy to help you in any way. You guys have a fantastic day. Peace. <laughs> Bye.